Good morning. So I did. Let's make sure this is loading up. I did hint that at some point I might actually fire up Cyberpunk 2077 just to show the graphics involved in this game. I don't want to say anything about the gameplay. It had a very, very rocky launch. Um, I got super excited for the game, bought a new computer and all this kind of stuff, and then um, had one of my save files just promptly disappear <laughs> entirely while I was playing it, so can't say I was entirely happy with the situation. But it is still, regardless of that fact, one of the most visually stunning games um, to ever come out. I have turned up um, all of the settings pretty much up to full, turned on stuff like NVIDIA's DLSS and everything like that, and so look, my frame rate just sort of standing around looking off to the distance is down in the 30s. So my computer's doing everything it can to survive the current situation, but it won't be able to do that much. So looking around, we're going to see some a little bit of like sort of fog stuff being rendered very nicely, very, very good lighting effects. So we're seeing a lot of individual little um, lights, not just point lights, but emissive surfaces even. If we if we want to look at these carefully, let's let's go back and so you can see my reflections here. I don't think they're reflecting me. No, I don't appear to be involved in the real-time cube map. But we see a bit of a exposure, real-time exposure, HDR going on here. But there are a lot of real-time ray tracing reflections happening. And we look at these brightly lit areas with the, um, well, not brightly lit, it's actually high contrast areas, um, dark areas with lit. Things, we're getting volumetric lighting going on here, so it's lighting the fog around it and things, there's the steam and smoke and stuff. Planar reflection going on here. But also, look at the quality of the reflection as it moves between the um, the pure plane and the kind of more specular surfaces and it fades out as the puzzle puddle dries and things like that. Oh, hello. Special guest as well. Chicken has come here to say hello for the last lecture of the year for us. Oh, hello. And we have another special guest in the comments. Hi, Dan. How are things? <laughs> I mentioned to Dan that it was the last lecture of the year, and so he's here to say hi. Um, this is Cyberpunk 2077. Looking at this because of um, the amazing graphics in this game, so we look at like, look at what we're getting with reflections, look at what we're getting with ambient shadows and things like that. So this is this is the game with the ray tracing on. Um, these. I don't know if they just got away with um, environment mapped reflections off these, off these beads and things here, but yeah. All right, let me um see if I can find another area. There's some, or even just here, if we're just looking at like the reflections off the different surfaces, so we've got a genuine cube mapped reflection. Actually, if you see that billboard up there, is changing what it's displaying and here, so we're definitely getting a, um, a real-time cube map here. And a lot of things with light just kind of reflecting off different surfaces, ambient lights, ambient shadows, and stuff like that. So the, the clarity of what we're getting in this. On top of the fact that I would say artistically this is probably one of the most clearly fleshed out worlds 
in a computer game in terms of like every single little detail and it's highly detailed as well like all these little bits and pieces everywhere i'm not going to talk too much about what it actually looked like when it started bugging out and things if we're really lucky we'll see a car like fly off into the distance up into the sky or like um <laughs> see exactly the same person <gasps> there, there, there okay okay this person i didn't expect to see this and this person, they're the same person. Where'd they go? Wait, the other one disappeared. That's a classic cyberpunk bug. <laughs> it's the, the, uh, I didn't think we were gonna... Oh, wait. This person was just over there as well. Where were they? I don't know, but classic cyberpunk bug is to see the same person turn up in two different locations. Anyway, I still wanted to show it to you because I still think it is... Probably, it's about a year old now, but it's probably still one of the pinnacles of visual um, visual design, both technically and artistically, that has happened in computer games. Um, some nice physically based rendering on these different reflective metals and things like that. We've seen good cars, though. We've seen good cars even in much older games. So this isn't as new when it's a full rigid surface like that. But I think this kind of low light setting with things like the um, this billboard casting a really nice shadow here. So it's a soft shadow from a large light source. So it's not a point light. It's it's an emanating rectangle of light. Um, and like even just, just, I love it. You know, Mark fires up famous computer game and the only thing Mark does with... Um, famous computer game is look at the ground around a billboard to talk about ambient shadows and things like that but this is this is i think the thing that makes um games like oh, this guy's here again the guy with the gold jacket who walked past a few minutes ago anyway it's these lighting effects and things that really sell a game and really put us uh deep into the immersion in a game like this but the same guy with the gold jacket walking past twice is going to break that emotion immediately. So, you know, that's that's a different issue. Like, how good does this look? This area here, now we get lots of lights competing with each other over the same space. And there's no, there's no distinct individual light source. There's a whole lot of, um, ooh, look at the lens flare going across my screen. So cool. Anyway, we should get to the actual lecture. Um, still, I'm glad we can get to the point where I can show something like this, and you, especially having tried to implement some of these things, um, can see how it... Why is that popping up there? You can see how it's... The advancement of what people are capable of doing in in really really difficult games like that you can see how it um um how it shows a, how that extra work and like getting my my beastly computer game rig down to like 30 or so frames per second means it's really it's really costing um yeah so how are we doing in comics <laughs> the, the Keanu Reeves game the super buggy exploitable game <laughs> Um, so Commerce is asking, if a game has ray tracing, does that mean the shadows are also created with a similar method, not the method we discussed in the last lecture? Um, changing camera's perspective, rendering depths and stuff like that. Highly likely, yeah. So one of the first things that's going to happen um, with um, with turning on a system like DLSS, which is the super sampling ray tracing, I'm actually going to talk about that today, it's in my list of things, um, uh, is you'll likely to have ray traced shadows. So you're likely to get um, really soft shadows, uh, ambient-based shadows and things like that, rather than the hard-edged shadows that you're going to get from shadow mapping. Um... <laughs> Little do I know that each duplicate we see in the world is a spy doppelganger deployed by the main boss to keep track of the world. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's get into the lecture, because we actually have a bit to talk about today. There's a bit that's just wrap-up, but there's actually a lot of content in today, so we'll see how we go uh, getting through it all. But, 
should remind everyone, I wore my Game Over t-shirt. Um, the, the thumbnail that we were talking about earlier from the, um, from this lecture is actually the Mario Game Over screen. So I've gone from like really, really old game to also really, I guess it's not the newest, but very new game, especially technically speaking, Cyberpunk's still a very new game because one could say that it's still not finished. <laughs> I've still got patch patches and fixes that they're going to deploy early next year to to complete the game so there's a there's a lot of work still to be done but anyway let's get into get into what we're talking about today so what did we do last lecture last lecture we covered two pretty major and not easy to implement techniques um shadow mapping and deferred rendering i mean i don't know partly i would say not easy to implement but also that's just because of where we're at. We can see how they would be implemented. So I think it's be interesting if you're if you're wanting to go deep into the third assignment, um, the sort of take home exam slash assignment. If you want to go deep, you could take on one of these, or even if you're super super keen, take on both of these, uh, and um, and and try to implement your, them yourself. They are really applications of the render to texture techniques we've been talking about. Deferred rendering is also uh, very much an implementation of um, complex post-processing as well. So it's, it's good. I mean, like, in, if anything, part of what's in the deferred rendering post-processing is easier than other post-processing because there's no new algorithm going on. It's actually the old lighting algorithm. It's just done in a particular order. So shadow mapping, what we did to figure out whether something was in light or or not reached by a light source, i.e. a shadow, um, is to render from the light's perspective. And we don't have to do a full visual render from the light's perspective. We were doing only a depth render from the light's perspective. So that way we could tell the distance between our light and the objects in the scene. Um, and then when we were um, rendering a fragment from our main camera's perspective, we would transform using our um, view matrix, we would transform the fragment's position back into the light's perspective and test it against what the light thought it could see versus the actual depth of the fragment. And if they're the same, then it receives that light's lighting contribution. But if they're not the same, um, uh, then we assume, or especially if the fragment's further away than what the light thinks it can see, um, we say that the light can't reach that particular fragment. When we're doing deferred rendering, what we're doing is we're doing our lighting in our post-processing pass uh, instead of trying to do our lighting per fragment. So as we know, every fragment that we render on the screen per pixel in a sense, we can have multiple fragments per pixel, multiple objects that are in front or behind each other. Um, if we do our expensive lighting calculation on all the fragments from the back to the front, um, we're going to end up sort of wasting a lot of that because a lot of these things aren't visible, but we're still doing lighting calculations on them. So if we do our lighting in post, then we're only doing our lighting once per pixel on the screen, not once per fragment, which is great. We can do one better than that. And we can confine, I guess, the, um, the number of pixels that each light works on by saying each light only has a kind of a sphere of influence. And we can literally use spheres for that by rendering our light volumes. So what we do is each light can affect a certain area and we render the, um, the lights as, um, as geometry in our scene, in a sense, in our second pass in the deferred rendering. And in our lighting pass, we can see which pixels are affected by our light sources and not. And those that are affected by our light sources will have those lights calculated um, and those um, that don't will not. So deferred rendering is quite good because it takes us from a time complexity of uh, number of lights multiplied by the number of fragments to effectively a time complexity of number of lights plus the number of pixels, um, which is which is a huge difference. We're taking a multiplication of a larger number down to an addition to a constant number, which, I mean, I don't know if I should call pixels a constant. You know, when we're doing time complexity analysis and um, uh, when we get to a constant number, we just remove it from the equation. I don't think that we can call pixels a constant that we're gonna remove from the equation because when your constant is in the, um, is in, what is it in the millions? 
Oh, it's totally in the millions. Thousands. It's it's over a thousand times over a thousand. So it's in the millions. If it's in the millions, you you, you probably don't want to go. Oh, that's just a constant. We won't worry if that gets multiplied by things, <laughs> right? So it still counts. Um, the number of pixels we render is still, um, is still important for efficiency calculations and things like that. Okay. So what are we covering today? Today we're looking at two things. Um, as usual, kind of like two one-hour segments. The the first one we're going to talk about is optimization. Um, this was, um, I don't know if he's here today, Matt Turner, our, um, our subject admin, was saying, we haven't really talked about that, you know, but it's, it's like a, a pretty fundamental thing to graphics. And I was like, yeah, we should probably talk about that. Um, I was wondering whether I should have talked about it earlier, and then I realized that I had. <laughs> but not in a specific way. When we're talking about optimization. We're talking about trying to get the maximum number of frames per second we can out of our out of our visual code in a sense so trying to get the best we can out of the um out of the effort that we can put in to our render so i was just looking at my graphics card just then i was just like how hard are you working right now not so much but in general you know um so we want to look at what what is our goal with graphics you know like what are we trying to achieve we're we trying to achieve a certain level of visual fidelity um, and how much is it going to cost us? So um, it's like a combination of how um, how good something looks. I mean, like that's how good something, right? Right? It's like how do you even compare that <coughs> versus how smooth its animations are? And we're going to talk about some actual specific techniques, as which is about culling, which we haven't talked about specifically. And it's about removing parts of the scene that we can't see. So we're going to talk a, a little bit about a couple of techniques. That's pretty much the only like course specific technical stuff that I'm going to talk about today. Most of the course is really wrapped up. And then we're going to do a wrap up of the course. So two things that I'm going to talk about for the wrap up for the course is where are we now? Like, what have we learned? Where, where are we up to? Um, and where can we go from here? The where can we go from here bit is, is quite hilarious. So what I did I did this last night, actually. I sat down and I asked myself that question, where can we go from here? And I just started writing down things. So I wrote, I wrote down a list of, of kind of everything that I could have taught but didn't. And some of these things I could consider, I could have taught these alongside what we taught, but the majority of these things were like, no, nah, this is just niche, or this is an extension of what we're doing, or... This is not what I consider the core of graphics, but are add-ons to graphics. I mean, I taught you a few things that were I wouldn't consider to be the core of graphics and are just add-ons. Like something like post-processing, you'd get away without doing it. But it's a very, very good thing to think about because that learning path we went through to get um, from just basic lighting and stuff like that to post-processing, to rendering to textures, the technique of rendering to textures allowed us to do so much more. Uh, than if we only were rendering from our from our main cameras, so I thought that was worth doing, um, and I hope that uh, where you've gotten to from um, from what you knew about graphics at the beginning, I hope you've discovered something on this this kind of trajectory that we've taken through the very much the computer science side of graphics. Um, we did really, we still did talk about the artistic side of graphics, but we didn't talk about you know creating 3d models in so much as I, I did cover it for like one hour or two hours or something like that but i mean if if you're thinking about the difference between a graphics program programmer and a graphics artist um the artists would have gone through you know a course this long just thinking about say concepting or um uh or just 3D sculpting and things like that, let alone 3D sculpting, texturing, animation, rigging, all this kind of stuff that would be like, you know, the equivalent of a whole degree's worth of separate subjects. So we didn't get that deep into that. Anyway, I'm going to do, I'm going to do, a, I've got it later, the, the any percent speed run of everything else in graphics. Um, I don't know how deep I'm going to get into that. We'll see how we go. But anyway, I should, I should start getting into the comp content, right? So thinking about optimization. We can't really think about optimization without thinking about what our goal is. Because you can't optimize towards nothing. You have to optimize towards um, efficiently reaching your goals. 
So that is like a the definition of what we would be doing if we're trying to optimize a process. We're trying to trying to get a process to a goal the most the easiest way we can. So if you if you think really simple computer science, if my goal is to have a sorted list of integers, right? So we're talking like, you know, first year uh, computer science stuff. If I want a sorted list of integers, um, then um, there are many techniques to do it. Some of them are less optimized than each other. Some of them are optimized to use less CPU to get something done. Uh, some of them are optimized to do things without using extra memory. And then some of them are capable with good optimization to be able to run with no extra memory and the minimal amount of CPU. So it's like, it's that kind of thing. It depends on what your goal is, uh, what you optimize for. So what are our goals in graphics? One of them could be this idea of perfect graphics. And I put a question mark here on purpose. I don't know what perfect graphics is. Um, but one question is, can we recreate reality? Um, and is there a Turing test for graphics? Um, so the Turing test, I, I am assuming that most computer science students will know at least a little bit about the Turing test because it's, you know, it's a little bit famous, is the idea that if we have a conversation and it doesn't have to be with audio um early turing tests were done just with typing text so you couldn't um you couldn't necessarily tell from voice modulation or anything whether the the thing that you're chatting with is a computer or a human um and it was considered that computers would have reached a, a specific and genuine milestone if people couldn't tell the difference between whether they're conversing with a human or a computer, because the kind of knowledge, the context, the, um, the obvious kind of reactivity of the conversation, uh, should be very difficult for the computer to do. So Alan Turing came up with this test and it's, it's quite interesting. And so I thought, is there a Turing test for graphics? And so the thing I, I thought of immediately was deep fakes. Um, so this is a deep fake of, Luke Skywalker, um, and, uh, this one was, there's actually, there's a YouTube video there, uh, I can't, now that I've said which character it is, if you haven't watched a lot of, um, Star Wars things, and you don't want stuff to be spoiled, don't click on this YouTube link. <laughs> I don't, I think, I think I've already ruined it anyway. It doesn't matter. Oh, well, I apologize if I've ruined something. But what I'm talking about here is not really the storyline of these things. But Mark Hamill at the moment is, I think, in his 60s. I can't remember exactly how old he is. He does not look like this anymore. This is him at roughly, you know, late 20s by the looks of him. Late 20s, early 30s, maybe. And so this is a CG recreation of him and he, he in his appearance, um, looks reasonable in in the the small TV segment um, that he's in. But I don't think this necessarily passes what we would call a Turing test for graphics. You can kind of tell that it's not perfect, but that just means that's one p potential goal. One potential goal is to have graphics so successfully replicate a human being that we can't tell that it's not an actor in a scene. And people are talking about the idea that in the future we may have movie stars who are not human, and movie stars who are entirely um, uh, graphics and AI generated. And so it's not just graphics here. Part of it is the, the artificial, artificial intelligence that goes into um, human-like animation and things like that. So that's graphics. <laughs> if we're talking about human-like animation, we're still talking graphics. Anything that has the, the visual effect, especially trying to trick people into believing, it's still graphics. So is this our goal? Is, is our goal to create scenes that are so realistic that we... Um, we believe that they were filmed on a real camera. Um, I talked a tiny bit about bokeh and bokeh and lens flare. Those are effects that don't have to happen in computers. Computer cameras are perfect. 
they do not need that um we have also chromatic aberration which is like the way that colors change as they pass through a glass lens so we do a lot of that stuff in um in graphics to copy uh real world degradation of visual data <laughs> in a sense um so it's interesting that we're already doing things to mimic cameras not even mimicking how you see the real world with your eyes but mimicking um, how cameras see the world in films so it's interesting this might be one of our goals um and i've said before there's a difference between realism and stylized graphics as well our goal might not be this kind of realism but maybe this is something we're trying to do because this is a very difficult technical goal to not just get people to look real but just a scene uh to look so real that we can't tell it apart um, from graphics in a real scene. And if we, we go back, you think about Cyberpunk that I was showing there, it's obviously not real. There's some really, really good lighting and shadows and things like that there, but you can see it. When I looked at that reflection in the puddle, I was impressed by the reflection in the puddle, but when it was just doing the, the kind of wet concrete specular, you could tell that's not real. It didn't look like a uh, real light reflection off concrete. So there's still there's still gaps in what we can do. Let's look at some of the things that get us really, really close to reality. So ray tracing. I, I, can't, I can't do a lecture anymore in this course without talking about ray tracing. Um, because ray tracing is the simulation that gets us as close as possible to, um, to real world lighting. Um, and we have to ask, is this the answer to this question? So if the question is, do we want perfect graphics, is the answer ray tracing? Um, it's possible. Um, it's possible that good enough ray tracing is the answer to our question because ray tracing is an attempt to simulate real light. So if it's an attempt to simulate real light, if those attempts get better and people get better at ray tracing, so we work out, you know, slightly better algorithms for, for calculating ray tracing, we get hardware that supports it in real time, that kind of thing, um, will we match reality? how close are we getting to this kind of perfect we're talking about um good enough to trick humans i was talking to people i think it was on the csc sock discord last night i just happened to have a conversation with people and it was like it was interesting how how kind of i don't know what the best word for this is but how cheesy graphics is how how little connection it has with um with real physics and how it's all just kind of these kind of hack jobs to get stuff to look a certain way um and it's interesting because ray tracing is like one of the techniques that doesn't attempt to do any of these hack jobs it att attempts to actually simulate real light but i guess one of the difficulties still is that while ray tracing looks like it will do amazing things in the future we're still right we're just on the cusp of it being like real time capable it is quite good in film though and we are definitely seeing films where the line between cg and reality is incredibly blurred um so we're seeing films that we look at them we go that is just a motion picture shot in the real world uh and there are no cg elements to it i bring you back again i talked about animal logic the film studio that's running um, that runs out of Sydney, actually very, very close to UNSW because they're at the entertainment quarter in, um, uh, in Fox Studios. I don't know if it's technically entertainment quarter, but you know, that, that area in Fox Studios, I think they're just, they're the real Fox Studios. Entertainment quarter is the bit where us, us public can actually go and hang out. But anyway, um, they worked on, uh, what's going to call it? Uh, the Great Gatsby. Great Gatsby appears to be a film that's entirely shot in a real world with real built sets and things, but um, it's worth going and looking at the making of that and seeing how little of that movie is actually real camera footage and how much of it is um, realistically recreated CG and how little we can tell the difference. So I think that's it's really interesting to see that this idea of perfection of, of, of realism in graphics has already been achieved for many different situations in film. Okay, ray tracing gets us, you know, that might be the pinnacle of what we're looking at for light, shadows, and reflections. Uh, it is not the pinnacle of what we're looking at for um, geometry, though. So it has, it has no no ability to create geometry. It has no ability to um, create surfaces and shapes and things like that. 
So I wanted to talk about another technique called voxels, and we haven't covered this in any way. I didn't even talk about this because um, it's entirely outside of the systems that we taught in the course. So we have polygons as the the very base building block of everything we've been doing. Like without polygons, we have nothing. No technique I've showed you works without them, I think. I'm trying to think of any techniques that would. Actually, no, screen space techniques would. Um, if we've already got things to pixels and we do our post-processing on them, then yeah, we don't care about polygons. So some of the stuff I taught you doesn't, but I would say polygons still integral to most systems that we've created. Um, but they are inherently unrealistic, nearly to the point where objects made up of polygons are novel and interesting in our world. So dice, for example, novel and interesting objects in our world. Nearly nothing else is genuinely made up of polygons. And even the dice aren't. They've got rounded corners and stuff like that. Um, so us using entirely polygons to recreate shapes and volumes and things like that is actually inherently unrealistic. So the perfection of the world might be to use something like po uh, voxels. And um, voxels are, again, I'm going to say an attempt. I've got an attempt here rather than um, rather than a succeeding at doing this thing yet, is an attempt to pixelate three-dimensional space rather than just pixelating the final output. So when we were doing polygon rendering, there is no resolution of a polygon. The polygon is an abstract thing that has vertices um, and builds its shape. So vertices and triangles, for example. Um, the rest of the voxel says, no, that doesn't exist. What exists is a point in space that occupies a certain amount of volume. Um, if you're into your indie games and stuff, or even even you could vaguely consider Minecraft to be something like this, that is the idea of voxels at a very much larger scale. So when they're so large that you can see them, um, then um, then it's really obvious what voxels are doing. They're, they're cubes in space. But if we can shrink voxels down to the point where they are, yeah, they're still cubes in space, but they're so small that they're kind of indistinguishable from each other, and they end up feeling like the pixels on our screen do. That is a kind of a, I don't know what to call it, I'd call it a distant goal uh, to do something like a real-time, high-quality computer game entirely in voxels. Um, this tech is something that people were working on back in, I don't know, I would say the late 90s? Um, before polygon rendering kind of became so efficient that it wasn't worth trying to do voxels. There were games that were released that were entirely in voxel-based systems, but that was a long time ago. Um, that was, like, nearly to the point where, like, voxels were, were set aside in that era when texturing and mapping got good enough that we could do quite good surface detail without needing to do something expensive like voxels. But anyway, voxels are still used for uh, certain things, so N NVIDIA's got a demo here of some of the uses of voxels, so it's worth checking that out. I took a photo here of it, of a, a volumetric cloud of voxels, and they were able to depth map all of the voxels to move them through and around an object. So there's some stuff going on with that. But the difficulty then is... We have to balance this against another factor. And the other factor is, can these techniques function in a way that we can see them happening? Do they work in real time? Um, and this is a question for games graphics and um, simulation graphics, not necessarily for film graphics, which is why films are happy to use stuff like ray tracing and voxels, because they've got a few minutes to, um, to render their scene, whereas... Um, in the games world, and everything we did for this course was in real-time graphics, so all the implementations we did were real-time, so I'm happy to talk about this, even though um, if we were more film-specific, I may not have this slide in it, but I think that this is still worth thinking about, because this is what we're balancing against. In film, they are balancing against the same thing, the time it takes to render, but the time it takes to render is like several orders of magnitude different. Um, so we're talking 1 60th per second versus like 8 minutes. So it's a very, very different scale. So this is based on the human belief in the persistency of a scene that we are looking at um, based on the, the frequency of change 
in that scene. If things change in that scene very, very quickly, um, but the change isn't much, but the change, is, the change happens very often, um, we're going to believe in the persistency of objects. So as I was looking at Cyberpunk before, we were only running at about 30 to 40 frames per second there. Um, but when we saw people walking around, we believed it. So the magic number is somewhere around 24. Uh, 24 frames per second is the... Um, uh, is the speed that films go at, and this was discovered quite a long time ago as being what people considered the minimum for people to accept motion. Um, but as we have seen, if you play a lot of games, that I would say 60 is probably a minimum that we want to be at, um, and it's very comfortable once you get to like sort of 80 to 100 and higher than that. Crank it up to like, you know, 240 if you've got the hardware for it, but um, it's a balancing act between how many frames per second you have and the visual quality because visual quality costs you frames in a sense every process that we add that makes things look better tends to uh, costs more processing power so anytime the frame rate drops that breaks us out of this belief that we had in persistency if we notice frame drops we lose immersion um, and so anything we're trying to do which is attempting to do realistic visuals must also maintain this frame rate to keep its sense of realism. Um, so when we're talking about stuff like voxels and ray tracing, they both have a, a very high cost um, in terms of processing. Like, I think even in this demo of voxels, I'm not going to show the videos right now. You can watch them later because they're like sort of five to ten minutes long each. Um, even in the voxels one, they do talk about, oh, this is used in film. And, and not necessarily talking about real-time techniques there. So we have this struggle, and it's always this struggle back and forth between how fast can we run algorithms? So can we design better algorithms to do the same thing with less processing power? Um, or can we wait for hardware development to push to the point where, um, where we're capable of running things faster? Um, and as you can kind of see from, from what was shown in the course, a whole lot of our techniques that we've used have actually been very hardware specific. Like I've said things like, because our GPU calculates in such a fashion, you know, uh, highly parallel, but in lockstep, um, uh, real time, well, not real time, floating point, uh, matrix like like sort of floating point floating point vector calculation in a sense um all of our techniques have gone back to utilizing that um that capability every time we want to do something so let's think about what we have learned this term so one thing that i think has carried through most of what we've taught this term is that if we if we use a dirty trick and I can't, I can't say anything nicer about the code that we use in graphics other than dirty tricks, because they really are using this little ball of jelly and this sack of mostly water um, to, to trick it into believing something. And that's all we need to do. We don't need things to be correct. We just need the trick to work. And these tricks often take less time than a genuine simulation or something like that hilarious Duke Nukem example where there, there was no mirror. <laughs> there was just a whole nother world, a whole nother <laughs> built reflection of the world on the other side of where the mirror was, you know, and that trick took way less processing power than the kind of reflections we actually do nowadays. Nowadays we do complex reflections and things with like different moving normals and stuff like that. So there's a lot of stuff going on um, nowadays, which I guess you could consider to be superior but all of it costs um, more processing power. So where instead of doing ray tracing and tracking where the lights are going, we're just doing angle calculations instead. So the only things we're doing is like uh, angle to the light, angle to the viewer, bam, that's, that's going to be our lighting. That's close enough. And for a lot of things, it is reasonably close, you know, uh, and we are not doing real surface. We're not modeling, even voxels are not real surfaces, but there's going to be a point where it's like, you know, pixels, pixels and voxels, right? Um, the, the smallest 
object that we can create visually will be the thing we're working with as opposed to at the moment where polygons are much bigger than the smallest object so any polygons we have are usually going to end up being larger than a single pixel so we're using an abstraction of these surfaces and we're using these awkwardly perfectly flat surfaces uh, rather than the real surfaces and then we use a lot of tricks to make them appear like real surfaces, uh, normals, curves, uh, well, normals instead of curves, uh, textures instead of detail, that kind of thing. Um, and the question is, what do we have to do because our hardware isn't capable enough, right? And so all of these things are things that we do so that our, our hardware can manage to make it through. Um, and so that our hardware can maintain enough of a frame rate so that we can continue to believe what's happening. And you look at the examples I've shown you over the course of the term over, over the time, as we built up our knowledge of the course, we've come forward in time from, I would say, early 90s to mid 90s, all the way through up until, I think, because we made it to deferred rendering, we got to about, and post-processing, we got to about 2005. Around, around there. So we, we have missed out the, the most recent 15 years of graphics, but I have feeling the course is packed enough as it is. It's packed enough with content as it is that I don't think it was necessary for me to, to, me to talk about anything newer than that. Um, Sam said, if, he's, if you're ever writing a film, you will include the line, there is no mirror in a dramatic moment. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about optimization. So I, I was actually haven't even got to optimization yet. I was just talking about the goals of optimization but I think I wanted to set the scene anyway. Let's look at this balancing act. There's a lot of text on this slide. Um, so on the one hand, maximum visual quality versus frames per second. And we are balancing between the two. So a lot of the time, what we will do is we'll try to get our frames per second to an acceptable amount and then maximize our, our visual quality given our frame rate limits so i could say i don't want my frame rate to drop below 60 how many of these features can i add in without dropping my frames um, below 60. so maximum visual quality would be doing ent my entire lighting pass with ray tracing um, at the moment i would say that staying above 60 frames a second with an entire ray tracing si situation is probably impossible so we have this blin fong lighting approximation we can do better than blin fong lighting by doing deferred rendering instead um, that's going to um, probably significantly speed up our um, our lighting pass uh, compared to ray tracing and using things like multiple lights if you use different shaders per light and material there's all this extra work that is going to make things look more realistic um, but we do not necessarily have the capability to do that in real time which is why we defer to I saw the word defer and deferred rendering and so I used it. You know when you see words, sometimes you just say them, but it made sense anyway. So we defer to these techniques instead. So voxels we could use, or instead of voxels, we could just use an extremely high polygon count. If we use a polygon count high enough, um, we can get to this magical place where we've kind of got one polygon per pixel. Um, and then we're going to not need things like textures we're going to not need things like surface normal maps or anything like that we can just have verts do it for us um but i don't think that most of our current hardware would be able to do this in real time so instead we go for a low polygon count and low is a subjective term it really depends on how much processing power is available um, and what you're doing with those polygons. Um, but lowering the number of polygons in a scene is a well-known thing to speed up our processing time. Um, and then we can have special effects like transparency and reflections, or, or we can use simple effects or just tricks in design so that, so that humans don't expect these things to happen. So if we look at older games, um, one of my favorites, like the Halo series, it never rains in Halo. I don't know if it never rains. I'm trying to think about any time where I may have seen it raining in Halo or not, but I know definitely if I'm looking at the early few, like Halo 1, Halo 2 and things, I very much doubt you'll see any rain. And if you see water, you very often won't even be walking into it. Like you'll die if you fall in the water and stuff like that, you know? So it's very much just kind of like, oh, you know what? We're not, we're just not going to do reflections 
Um, if we do any kinds of reflections, they'll mostly just be specular um, and things like that. They won't necessarily be like a, a cube map to reflection or anything like that. Uh, and very low levels of transparency as well. So we can use a lot of tricks so that we don't have to use these things. We just set games in certain environments so that um, uh, so that our engine can handle the the um, the work. So this isn't even an optimization. This is like a shortcut. Um, this is like hacking our way around optimization, where if we don't ask the human to believe in something that we can't implement, um, then it doesn't matter that we can't implement it. So again, going back to that thing that happened, that, that, that ends up being a core in graphics is that tricking the human may be more successful uh, than um, putting together the actual algorithm to make stuff <laughs> work perfectly. Um, yeah, so we're looking at high quality motion effects, animations, all this other stuff as well that's going to cost us things. Um, but the other things that we can do to make this work is intelligent removal of non-visible elements. We're going to talk a little bit about that today as well. So let's look at the course because I wanted to talk about everything that we've gone through. This is roughly in the order that we did things in the course and show you how optimization has actually been at the core of so many things we did. So we talk a lot of the time in computer science about creating a solution to a problem and then optimizing it. And it's not always done like that, um, but a lot of the time it's done like that. It's like, get your easy brute force solution happening first, prove that it is successful, then um, make it more, uh, more efficient. Graphics kind of goes this other way where it says, no, we need stuff that is going to be efficient first and then see how close we can get that to a solution to the problem. And if we can't get it that close to a solution to the problem, we're still going to use it. We're not going to go back and go, no, no, this must solve the, the problem. It must reach the goal of perfection. Go, no, we're just going to degrade the visual quality <laughs> to keep our frames per second up. So some of the things that we've been doing um, that are actually optimizations, um, but we taught them as if they're entire techniques. So polygons is one thing. Just using polygons is an optimization of surfaces. So what we've said is like we're going to approximate surfaces using a low poly count. So anything basically where we're using polygons instead of surfaces is going to reduce the amount of work that we have to do. I mean, you get a high enough poly count, you're going to burden your, your renderer to the point where you might as well have had a real curve there. Um, but instead of having real data between these vertices, we're just linearly interpolating. So we're allowing our maths to just kind of go, oh, you know, in the gap between these data points, just figure it out yourself. You know, we don't want to have to, like, use all this data and have to process it. So we're just going to make guesses in between the data. And that works quite well for us. This is a major, major speed pickup in terms of, like, what we can do with, um, um, what we can do with processing. Textures and maps give us surface data on these polygons instead of having geometry on them. So especially stuff like normal maps um, and even just color textures, you know, they give us detail in a very, very easy way to use as opposed to um, having individual vertices, each with their own color and own normals and things like that. We've got our depth buffer as well. So instead of actually measuring what we can and can't see, instead of say, casting a ray into the scene and seeing what it hits first, we're just rendering everything and saying, okay, whichever of those things using this approximation of our depth, this zero to one floating point approximation of our depth, whichever one of those things is closest to us, that is the thing that's going to be seen. Um, we work around the fact this is an approximate approximation by very, very rarely putting something directly in front of something else. So if you have a poster on a wall in a virtual scene, they'll usually be just magically so further apart than sitting directly on top of each other because we don't really have a nice way to say this thing's definitely in front of that thing even though they have roughly the same coordinates so they'll often just be shifted slightly to make sure they don't clip through each other um they call that z fighting i think i talked about that right um and then we use keyframed animation we're not using genuine movement again we're using the idea of interpolation so we have positions for our animations and interpolation in between those positions. We looked at Blinfong lighting. Um, I have spoken at length about Blinfong lighting, right? Um, well, we, we introduced it as Fong lighting and then we added Blin. And Blin only changes the specular lighting, so it's not a huge difference. But, you know, I, I like to refer 
to it as Blinfong now because we tend to use it as a complete thing. Um, ambient lighting in Blinfong is just a guess. It's just like, oh, whatever. You know, the whole scene has a rough amount of ambient light. Let's just go for it, right? It's it's probably the the, the most glaring optimization. I don't even call... I, I, you can't really call it an optimization. I would call it giving up. <laughs> giving up on global illumination. That's what Blinfong ambient lighting is. And specular lighting is also an estimate. I, say, I said uh, ambient lighting is a guess. Specular lighting is at least an estimate. It at least is doing some calculations along the way. Um, so the idea of reflecting a light source, yet it is not literally reflecting the light source. It's just reflecting the idea of the light source. Um, and you'll see that because um, the the specular highlights can really be altered based on how, how large or small you want them to be. Um, we can do stuff like light mapping, and we didn't really go into huge detail in light mapping. Light mapping is quite a difficult um, technique because it relies on you having another uh, lighting renderer to work with. So it's a way of um, not necessarily optimizing to get the task done within the frame, but it's just pushing it out entirely and saying, you know what, how about we just do all of the work of this um, before we ever get to real-time rendering? So you, this doesn't make it faster, um, doesn't make the process of global illumination faster, it just tries to do it at a different time where there, where there aren't time constraints. So if you've got several hours to do a light map, you can do the light map over several hours with a ray tracer and then plonk it into the scene, and the only work that the scene has to do is to sample from a texture map, and so that's much quicker. Um, when we were doing reflections, um, instead of bouncing our vision off reflective objects and seeing what it was, was seeing, we were using our rendering tech instead to render from multiple directions to see what we could see. And this is very, very much us saying, our hardware does one thing better than something else. It does rendering multiple pixels and the the, the floating point mass calculation to do that very quickly. Um, and it doesn't necessarily do what we call collision detection, which is a different technique, as quickly. Um, so we'll use our rendering technique again. Shadow mapping, we did exactly the same thing. It's very similar to reflections, um, where we use our rendering technique to figure out if there are intervening objects instead of um, tracing the actual... Um, paths of the light to see if things are between objects. Both of these two actually come together, like they're very similar techniques. Um, and then deferred rendering is like the big one, which is where we're talking about lighting, where deferred rendering literally does not do anything different in terms of the lighting result to our Blinfong lighting. It doesn't, it doesn't make the scene look different. Like, shadow mapping obviously makes the scene look different. Shadows will appear. Reflections obviously make the scene look different. Deferred rendering does not make the scene look different. Uh, it's the same scene, but it comes out faster. Uh, and if you want to now put more lights in it, you'll be able to put more lights in it without having um, uh, efficiency issues. Or so long as they are, like, you know, contained, attenuated point lights, um, it, totally, it totally works for that. So all of this does is says we're going to remove calculations for stuff that's non-visible or stuff that is so low influence um, that it's irrelevant. So uh, an attenuated point light and a, and a fragment across the other side of the scene. Um, in our standard blind form, we're going to calculate that and it's going to come out with 0 0.0001 or something like that, right? And if it's that irrelevant, we probably shouldn't have done that calculation at all. And deferred rendering allows us to reach that situation where we've just removed things that we didn't need to do. So, this is the thing I was saying earlier, actually, is that real-time graphics is more than optimization. I wouldn't say that we come up with ideas for how to light things and then we optimize them, or we come up with ideas of how to model things and then optimize it. Generally, a lot of the techniques that we're using were designed with optimization, well, they were designed for a sort of for an optimization purpose. It's like efficiency came before quality. Um, and I think this is really due to the fact that graphics grew in a period where the techniques and the hardware were being worked on at the same time. A lot of the techniques are actually a lot older than the hardware. 
we're talking 70s and 80s and things like that. Um, and I think that's because a lot of real-time graphics is following films. So what they did in films, we get in games sort of five, ten years later. Because if you've got eight minutes to do something and you want to do it in one sixtieth of a second, um, you will you have to wait for your hardware to catch up over that time. But we are very much ruled by this time constraint and whatever we have in our hardware that's capable. And so I think this is very much how graphics has grown by building up its ideas of what it's going to do as, as an industry, building up its ideas based on this limitation. This limitation has been hovering over graphics for its entirety of its development. And what we get is a whole series of techniques that are highly, highly optimized approximations um, rather than, you know, actual scientific simulation of anything. So let's look at one optimization technique. I've just got a couple of slides on this that I'm going to talk about, uh, which is culling. And we haven't covered this in any particular detail. Like I did talk about it a tiny bit, but not really that much. Um, but it's interesting how what I've said previously about optimization and frame rate is you can nearly literally count the number of triangles that you're rendering and use that as a measure of how efficient things are going to be. Now, this changes if you like want to do really specific effects and stuff like that. But in general, in general, our polygon is going... Uh, uh, in general, our rendering is going to be based on the number of polygons. So, if a polygon is not visible, it should not waste our processing power. But how do we know if a polygon is visible? A lot of the time, we don't know if things are going to obscure other objects. We don't necessarily know. But there are a lot of polygons we can remove from our scene um, safely before we try to render any of them. And this process is known as culling. So... First one, and this is actually a really easy one to do, is called backface culling. Um, so, do you remember vertex winding? I only mentioned it a little bit, but I mentioned it multiple times during the course, so you may have remembered it. Um, this is the order that the vertices are, are put in the index buffer. Um, and the order that they're put in that buffer changes which part of the... Um, of the polygon is the front. So which face is the front and which face is the back of the polygon. So if we're talking about modeling solid objects, we're talking about our polygons being put into a mesh, the mesh being considered the outer surface of an object, the back face of the polygons doesn't exist. So it's like saying, just looking for random objects. I'll just go for my cup again. It's always here. No, this is a bad one. It's transparent. <laughs> Here's another cup that I've got. No, it's a hollow object. This is all very awkward. I just need something solid. Here's one of my paint pots. So we don't see what's inside the paint pot. Um, what we get, I love how, how hard I had to look just for a single object. Um, the outside surfaces we can definitely see. The back of those outside surfaces is some weird idea about like, I don't know, what's inside the paint pot or something like that. Um, our camera is not going in there. And in reality, if we wanted to model the inside of that, the, the paint pot would have a certain thickness. So it wouldn't just be one polygon that we could see the back of. So the back face generally just doesn't exist, especially for any solid objects that we're using. I should just use my face. <laughs> the underside of my skin is not visible and there's no way that it, it should be visible. I mean, I'll be in a lot of pain if it's visible. But <laughs> that went way too long. Anyway. But the trick is, we can tell whether we're looking at a front face or a back face just by the order of the, the vertices. So are the vertices going in an anti-clockwise way? From your view, an anti-clockwise direction or a clockwise direction? What we can do is we can just look at that and say, um, if we can see the vertices in an anti-clockwise order, then that triangle is visible that triangle will then get passed into the render. It will go to the vertex shader and, and have stuff happen. Um, if it does not do that, if it is a, if the um, um, the verts are going in a clockwise direction and there are only those two options. So triangles, they're facing you in one way or the other. I mean, I guess there's a chance the triangle is going to be dead on horizontal to the camera, in which case it's not going to appear anyway. But in general, all of our polygons are either going to be some angle towards us or some angle away from us. And we can look at the direction 
that the um the vertices are winding around that polygon and say you're visible or you're not visible and this is kind of amazing so this is a really really simple technique that will remove literally i mean like depending on how your scene's set up it's going to remove 50 percent of the polygons from the scene so if you're looking at meshed 3d objects this is an automatic way to double your frame rate i mean it's not going to double your frame rate because it's kind of always on <laughs> And we always assume that it's on, so you don't really get to notice that this is doubling your frame rate. But if you go into your um, your assignments and things like that and specifically turn off culling, because culling is usually on by default, um, backface culling especially, um, if you were to turn off um, this culling, you would actually see, um, see your frame rate dropping. Uh, also depends, I don't think we actually wrote things like um, frames per second counters uh, into any of our tutorials. Um, I guess if I had, you know, a few extra weeks to squeeze into the course, we'd do things like that. We'd look at frame rate optimization and things like that. But you know, you only, you only have so much time. But anyway, the great thing about this, half your polygons never make it into your shaders. Um, and so specifically your fragment shader won't see half of the polygons. Fragment shaders usually wear the majority of the time is taken up in your render. So that's one nice thing. Um, anything that is facing away from us, um, we don't see. Um, so we can, we, can, we can optimize which polygons we're rendering like that by saying only the ones that face towards us are visible. Um, the other thing we can do is we can cull based on our camera's frustum. So if things are outside the camera's view, we, we literally can't see them. So I'm not going to render the stuff that's behind me if I'm looking from my vision um, because I can't see it, you know, I can't look behind myself. A lot of our vision is based on human vision. Um, a lot of our graphics is based on the fact that we see in, in, in a certain kind of forwards vision and our peripheral vision, yes, we can kind of see stuff there, but not at any great detail. So we don't really bother with it too much, but what's in front of us, we look at and so the trick is because we have these frustums um we can actually decide what is inside or outside our frustum and the nice thing about our frustums is they're made up of planes <laughs> so we have six planes um that determine what our, our frustum is and if we're thinking about geometry and we're thinking about planes it is very easy for us to decide which side of a plane something is on um it usually involves checking a lot of vertices on things. So a lot of the time we'll use stuff called bounding boxes um, to, to take complex objects and make us not have to calculate all their verts. Um, so what we could do is say, we've got a really complex human model. We would just put a rectangular prism around them or we'd put a, a, um, a sphere around an object or a, um, like a cylinder around a person or something like that. And that way, what we can do is we can test that simple low polygon object against each of these planes and decide whether it is inside or outside the visible area of the scene. So if it's outside the frustum, we cull it. We cull the entire object. None of its polygons make it to the renderer, which is nice, right? This, depending on where we are in our scene, actually cuts down even more polygons uh, than the backface culling does because we may only be looking at, say, a quarter of our scene. This really depends on the scene, depends on the camera, so I can't, I can't give you an actual value of how much, um, how much we're going to get out of Frost and Culling. Um, again, this is something that's already on automatic in OpenGL. We are not rendering the things that are outside the Frostum or behind the Frostum um, by default, and I think it's, you know, it's been this way for pretty much the entirety of polygon rendering. Um, so, yeah. This means that we're not rendering... So this is a hilarious little diagram here where I'm saying we're not rendering anything that's outside of this frustum. If things are half in the frustum, we can either decide, oh, you just render the whole object because it's there anyway. Um, or certain techniques might actually clip the object where they will create new vertices where the object hits the end of the frustum and just, just cut off the edge there so that we don't have to render anything. If it's a large object and we can only see a small part of it, that might be efficient. Um... Other times when it's not that efficient to start screwing around with the geometry of the objects, we can just say, look, just render the whole thing. 
it's still going to get us a lot of efficiency by cutting out, say, these three objects. And if we render the part of this object that's not in the scene, that's still okay. You know, it's never going to make it to pixels, um, but we needed to kind of render the whole object to see the bits that we could see of it. So fresh some culling is quite useful as well. Um, both of these things we didn't really need to talk about because they're just always on in OpenGL these days, but it's nice to know um, that some of these things that are happening in the background are very useful to us. They're saving us a lot of effort. So these are optimizations that sort of exist in the engine that we're using, exist in the OpenGL AP. Last break time, so I want to ask you about what is it you want to make? So what I'm hoping is that we have reached a point in this course where you are potentially capable of making things. So, I mean, I'd hope so, because you've done two assignments now on making things with graphics. Um, so you can think about what you might want to make in the future. So sometimes it's like, what feeling do you want to evoke? A lot of art is based on what feelings um, you would like your, your viewer or your player or um, the experiencer, the user to feel. Um, and would, are we going to do that in a game? Are we going to do that in effects for a film or something like that? Um, or did you, or is it not about you wanting to make stuff? You just wanted to learn about how games are made or how films are made. Um, that's fine as well. Um, but I want to say that like, um, hopefully during this course, you've learned something and, um, that pushes you a little further along the path you may have been where you're wondering how this stuff works or wondering how this stuff exists. Um, and now you're like, I have a decent idea about how this stuff works. Now I could think about creating this stuff myself. And I just want to say, don't stop creating because this is like one of the cool things. And you don't have to be, it's just, I, I'm not saying you have to keep doing graphics work, but creating ideas, creating new things, thinking about experiences you'd like to bring yourself or other people through is something that I think is a really wonderful thing to do. So never stop creating. Dan's going, I want to make a graphics engine that only uses Babylonian methods and base 60, ar base 60 arithmetic. Oh my God. All right. I need a break so that I can deal with the fact that someone wants to actually use base 60 arithmetic. How many digits are there? Like we don't even have enough letters to do that. I assume the Babylonians have enough letters to do that. Anyway, let's go and break. It's 1107. We will come back at 12 past, um, 11 and then i'm um, going to do the second part which is like the where have we reached and where could we go from here all right back soon
All right, I'm back. I'm sorry, Hao Chung. <laughs> That's I. I, I, I totally feel you there. Like, <laughs> they were saying this course ruined games for me. Can't play any game now without losing my mind over some dirty ceramic tiles. <laughs> uh, let me talk to you about game design sometime, and that'll ruin gameplay as well for you. Although it hasn't entirely ruined gameplay. Yeah, it has. No, it has. I was going to say it hasn't entirely ruined gameplay for me, but no, it totally has. There's a lot of games now, if I play them, I'm just like, nope. Your gameplay is boring. I'm moving on immediately, you know. <laughs> but then there's other games that I play, it's like, your gameplay, I know your gameplay's not that great, but your loop is compelling enough that I'm just stuck in it anyway. So, you know. <laughs> oh my god, a zombie is killing me, but damn, look at its shadow. Must be Blinfong. <laughs> That's really funny. Um... Kumaris is asking if we're running ray tracing for shadows and for lighting, are we doubling ray tracing no we're actually using the same ray tracing for both um because when you think about it if the lights bounce off objects that they can like add their lighting component to objects as they're bouncing past um and it's actually the shadows are just not done it's not that the shadows are specifically cast the shadows is the absence of rays hitting objects and that's what makes ray tracing shadows so good because the more statistically higher likelihood of shadows re of, of rays of light reaching an area um, are going to brighten it and statistically lower likelihood is going to darken it so we get these really nice ambient shadows as well and we get nice things where things reflect light off each other and when they reflect light then they illuminate things which takes away some of the ambient shadowing so it's like ray tracing is like a single pass if you can call the sheer amount of work that ray tracing is a single pass it kind of is um, and it can do lighting reflections and shadows all in one go because it's all about following where the light goes um, Brandon saying, genuinely, this is true. We were gaming last night talking about, wow, look at this specular lighting here. <laughs> Ignorance is bliss. Yes. I should have put a, a caveat on this course at the beginning. It's like, you're not going to be able to just watch stuff anymore. You're not going to be able to just consume in a happy, ignorant way anymore. Once you know the back end and how difficult it is, the tricks don't work on you as much anymore. Okay. Let's wrap this sucker up can't believe we're in the last lecture of the year uh, it's been it hasn't been the longest year ever i think last year was a longer year than this year this year there were moments where we were a bit more relaxed um, than last year but still it's been a long year that has raced to its conclusion at the same time so very very weird but where are we at this point what have we learned we did an introduction to computer graphics so we're talking about this approximate simulation of human vision. And that's the most we can say. It's an approximate simulation. We use polygon rendering and we learned about the maths that support it. Uh, we learned about Blinfong lighting and we learned about doing that with maps like specular maps and normal maps and things like that. And we talked a bit about graphics as it is a technological medium for the creation of art. So computer games as interactive art um, and things like that. And so I think this is an interesting thing to do. And I think this is a good way to get an introduction into graphics. We learn about, like from a computer science side, is we learn about how to create it and why it exists. Um, we also added extras to this. So we did things like um, a, a very small subset of visual effects that can be used for graphics. So reflections, transparency, shadows, and post-processing effects. I guess because we got to post-processing effects, we actually did um, get to a lot of possibilities for visual effects. Um, but as, as, I, as I say here, it's an introduction. It's not a full education. I can't say to any of you, you are now world-leading experts in computer graphics. I would say that you are interested enough that you could eventually become world-leading experts in computer graphics. Um, so as an example, I, I, I was saying here that um, a lifetime can be spent on just one thing. Um, so you could, you could start to develop algorithms for shadows um, and you could devote, you know, like a PhD or something just to algorithms for shadows. So I can't say to you, yeah, all right, now that we've done this course, you've got everything. <laughs> There's still a lot missing, but I still think that we've got a decent introduction to this, you know? So I've seen people implementing, the, I mean, 
Granted, this is the Flex channel on Discord, but I've seen people re-implementing things that are, are getting close to the renderers that are used in games. I mean, like, simple games and things, but still getting those ideas um, and seeing how you can make your own homebrew version of, of games that exist. And you can say, I can get, even if I can't get the, the actual visual fidelity of that game, I can see how they made that because I can get, you know, halfway there. And, and I think that's cool, and that's good enough. So the question now is, like, what's next? Uh, where do we go from here? And so, as I was saying before, I asked this question of myself. I, I'm looking at the clock now and seeing if I can get through this. We'll see. So I said, where do we go from here? And so I wrote some stuff down about where we can go from here. Now, this list breaks all of my rules for how much data I will ever put on a single slide <laughs> in a course, but I thought it would be funny for me to um, to say this just because this was like about an hour of me just writing down stuff that I know I didn't teach. Um, I don't know about all of these things. Well, I know about most of them, but I don't know about... I, don't, I definitely don't know them all in detail enough to to really show you anything. But anyway, here's a list of the things that you could continue on to learn about. Um, or a list of things that, like, really could... You could do already, um, but I just haven't shown it to you specifically. Um, and so what I thought I'd do... This was some of the, the funnest uh, lecture prep I've ever done. Is I did... Okay, I can have one slide for each of these, and I'm going to do one slide for each of these, and we're going to try to go through it all and tell you just an overview or an introduction to, to each one of these points that I wrote down. So here's the any percent speed run of what's next in graphics. I have 40 minutes remaining today, and I have, I don't know, 15 slides. So let's see if we can cover some of the things in this list, and we're going to cover them very quickly. But I think that you will find that some of these things, you have a reasonable understanding of them because of the foundation that you have in computer graphics already. First thing, anti-aliasing and anisotropia. So I put these two together on one slide. Um, we've talked about some of this already. I have mentioned both of these things. Um, and really, like, if you want to, you could say that this list, it's not exactly... There's a lot of these things that are hidden behind the scenes, but a lot of the things in this list are things that you can turn on and off as settings in games. So anti-aliasing and anisotropy are both things that people probably know about. So um, these are one of these issues is a diagonal line being drawn in a pixelated surface. Pixelated surface is is a square grid uh, surface, um, and so. To do a diagonal line, you're going across the grid, then down, across, then down, across, then down. We get these jaggies. Um, and I, I consider both of these techniques to be like, there's jaggies, <laughs> and we want to eliminate them. And we do them both in a similar way. Um, we do this by um, multi-sampling. So the awkward sampling of the texture, I think I did cover this at least a little bit. Um, awkward sampling from a texture as the... Um, the samples of the texture start to try to sample a great number of texels at the same time. We actually talked about solving that with mip mapping um, by having different sized textures as you go off into the distance. We can also use multi-sampling techniques, uh, anisotropic filters and stuff like that to, um, uh, to get that. And with anti-aliasing, we're also using multi-sampling techniques to get a combination of the two colors um, based on how much of the pixel is one color and how much is the other. The geometry shader and particle systems, they're not necessarily the same thing, but they, they sometimes go hand in hand. I'm just going to move my face temporarily out of the way. Here is the uh, OpenGL4 pipeline. So we didn't even use the OpenGL4 pipeline. And there are some parts of this pipeline that are added in um, that we didn't look at. Uh, a tessellation shader, geometry shader. Um, I think that's actually the only things that we didn't look at. I guess the per sample operations here, but even that, that's that's really our post-processing there. Anyway, so in between the vertex shader and the fragment shader, there's a bunch of other stuff happening, and we can put in these extra shaders. So the first one I'm going to talk about is geometry shader. Geometry shader allows us to draw, draw geometry in the shader. So what we can do 
is. We can specify a set of vertices initially. So we can specify verts in our scene, and then we can say, apply the geometry shader to these verts. And what it's going to do is, based on the position and the orientation of those, um, of those vertices, we can create shapes around where they are. Um, and so this is the way that we can, um, we can add geometry to our scene. Um, by adding space around our verts. And this works quite well if we want multiple repetitions of the same shape. So if we want multiple repetitions of the same shape, what we can say is like, all right, I'm just going to give you positions for these shapes and the shader can add the geometry. And so this way, we, instead of replicating our, um, our identical geometry multiple times and having to have separate vertex buffers and index buffers for them and stuff like that, we can say, look, just let the geometry shader deal with it. Uh, it will create all these extra vertices. Um, and so I put particle systems in here because uh, particle systems is a visual effect that we didn't cover uh, in the course, um, but I've already seen someone implement a particle system in their assignment too. Um, but we use this for things that don't have kind of static geometry. So this is very sort of nebulous geometry. So smoke, fire, fog, um, volumetric substances we'll often use particle systems for. And usually this is made up of hundreds of thousands of just little rectangles with a sprite or something on them. So a textured rectangle. Uh, and what they are is they're constantly rotated to aim towards the camera. So no matter where you are in the scene, they're always aiming towards you because they're representing a, a volume particle, but since we can't be bothered representing a volume particle anyway in polygon rendering, we just do it with a flat plane that always aims towards you no matter where you are. Um, and we can build these things using the geometry shader if we want to. It's not the only use of the geometry shader, we can do other stuff like that. We can, we can even visualize normals using a geometry shader because the geometry shader gets vertex information and then can draw other verts. Um, but yeah, we can in particle systems uh, create the geometry, create the particles with the geometry shader, or we can reuse one piece of geometry and render it multiple times. There's different ways of doing it. Um, tessellation. So there's another shader in here. So there's a tessellation shader and a geometry shader. The geometry shader is, I mean, like both of them, are, like when you when you read about them, both of them seem very similar. So it was good for me to talk about both of these one after the, the other, because both of them are adding verts to the scene, but they do it in subtly different ways. The geometry shader is usually for the repetitive creation of uh, geometrical objects, whereas the tessellation shader is usually used for adding geometry data to objects that already exist. So the difference being the geometry shader is like creating objects. The tessellation shader is adding detail in objects. Both of these shaders are adding vertices. They're going to add verts and connect them up to other vertices. But the tessellation shader is usually doing this by subdivision. So what it's going to do is it's going to say, you got all these triangles, but you wanted more detail. If you want more detail, I'll subdivide these triangles. So I will put a vert um, either in the middle of a triangle or halfway along um, one of the edges of the triangle and create another triangle there. We can do this multiple times at multiple depth levels um, and we end up with a, um, a surface that is closer to the, um, the theoretical curve that the, um, uh, that the original geometry was trying to... Um, uh, what's my call it? Trying to approximate. And so this works quite well. And like one of the examples is something like a human face, because we may have a human face that takes very few pixels. It's often a distance. We may have one that's very, very close and we, we can really see the, te the, um, the tessellation. I shouldn't use the same word. We can, we can see the separation of it into triangles um, if we get too close. And so maybe as we get closer, we want our shader to actually change the um the geometry of it as we get closer to it it's also quite useful for terrain systems where we say here's a big flat plane in our scene um but as we get close to it we probably want to see all the minute little differentiation in height we don't want a perfectly flat plane like we notice when we see a perfectly flat plane in um in a computer game you you kind of like when you're walking on it you just go is this whole place actually flat and you look at games like open world games and stuff you will never really see open perfectly flat surfaces unless they are human created surfaces or their bodies of water or something like that landscapes do not remain flat 
you know, just erosion should move and stuff. Um, oh, Simon's saying there's a compute shader as well. Yeah, there's a compute shader as well. There's other stuff in... There's a, there are more complicated diagrams than this one that I have here for the, the shader pipeline. Um, anyway, but then these, are, these are the ones I'm talking about at the moment, is just the geometry and tessellation shaders. Um, so we can have terrain systems, and we can actually do tessellation not just as a pure subdivision of the um, diverts are there. Um, sometimes we can do this based on algorithms for how deformation of this surface might happen. So we might actually say that um, if the normals at two vertices look like this, then the next vert that gets created won't be in between those two exactly. It can actually be shifted upwards because of the angle of those normals. And so we can start to actually build um, geometric surface detail that didn't exist but was only implied previously. So it's pretty cool. Uh, a tessellation shader can give you extra detail both in nat well actually not both but just in natural surfaces whether they're terrain or or um, organic features like people. I don't know if I'm spending too long on these slides. We'll see how we go. Uh, it's, I think we're okay. I think we're okay. Um, physically based rendering. <laughs> I'm doing this technique a great disservice by only putting it on one slide, but it has to be included in this list. Um, so I want to say this is realism in surface details. I think originally this was for um, the Pixar movies, I think. Um, um, it's now the standard lighting path in the Unreal Engine. I don't know if it is also in the Unity Engine, but it's kind of, um, it's kind of quite capable for many things. So... It was built as an attempt to render surface detail better than um, than the Blimfong lighting system. So with if you have your maps, your diffuse map, your specular map, and your normal map, uh, and you're very careful with how they work, you can simulate a lot of different types of materials with those. Um, but you are still limited in the fact that, say, your specular reflection is in your lighting uh, it's in your shaders. It's it's not necessarily something that you can simulate on your on your surface materials that easily, unless you're really careful and you run different shaders for different surfaces, which is possible until you do deferred rendering where it's not possible. So anyway, physically based rendering is this idea that maybe we need more information on our surfaces. So we have a series of buffers on our surfaces, and they're going to do more things than. Um, um, than we have otherwise. So some of these things we've seen already. So the albedo of the surface is just like the color reflection of the surface. This is like a, a diffuse texture. Um, the metallic surface is kind of like our specular texture, normal map. So we've got these things, but we also have roughness and ambient occlusion maps and stuff. So when this was originally used for metallics, it was kind of like a simulation of what what people would call micro facets. So the fact that when light hits a surface, even on a metallic surface, it doesn't bounce straight off. And you can definitely tell this if you see any, like, um, the difference between a polished metal surface and, and a scuffed or sanded metal surface, um, <coughs> or a brushed metal surface, where um, the light hits it and it kind of scatters, even though it has metallic and it has a specular reflection. So it's, it's combining the specular and diffuse reflections by saying, yes, it is definitely specular. It directly reflects light, but it doesn't all go in the same direction, which is like somewhere in between diffuse and specular. Um, and also we're talking about this idea of reflectance and radiance. And there's also a lot of techniques that are used with physically based rendering to get light moving through an object, not just bouncing off the surface. So subsurface scattering, I have mentioned subsurface scattering before in the course, I remember this, where the light hits an object and it doesn't necessarily um, uh, immediately bounce off. It might go into the surface and get reflect off internal parts of an object and then come out. So I did it by just like shining a light through my hand and you'd see that the light emanates from my hand based on a lot of internal reflections. Um, so this is a model that tries to do all of that stuff. Um, 
And so it's called physically based because it's it's a step closer to physics, but physically based, as you can see, is like a it's a vague term still. It's not uh, it's not physically accurate rendering, but yeah, it's very very cool. Um, I think if you want to play around with this and don't want to necessarily implement it yourself, I can suggest downloading something like Unreal Engine and playing around with just its its shader path. In fact, I should have put a slide here about pre-made engines, but I talked about that a little bit last last lecture, so maybe you didn't have to. Um, stylistic renderings. I just want to put in a screenshot of my own game. Of my not my I didn't make the game, but this is like one of the characters that I have in Genshin. So there's a lot of stuff we can do if we step aside from the realistic path of rendering, which we didn't really do in the course, because anything that we're going to do, which is like not a simulation of real lighting, um, it's very specific because, because we're going to a very specific, um, direction when we're doing this. So this one, I thought, let's look at animation, like cell shading, uh, anime or comic style, um, rendering. So we can modify our lighting algorithm to be a on or off Thing. So if you look at the shadow on this guy's back, um, instead of it being a smooth change in the lighting, in our diffuse lighting, because it's just diffuse lit, um, instead of being smooth going from this darker color to this brighter color, there's a threshold cutoff where it's like all the lights on or all the lights off. So this is actually a, a really simple, um, uh, a simple model for lighting. It actually simplifies the lighting. Or you can just add a switch into it. So that, okay, here's our flick between dark and light, you know, and that's a two tone shading, which is like the the cell shading that used to be done on. It's called that because it's on cellulo cellulose, no cellulite cellulose. cellulose. <laughs> I can't remember which one it is. One of those is body fat, and the other one is the material for animating on. I think it's cellulose. Anyway. Um, the other thing that we can do is we can outline things in the same way that we would draw outlines for things if we're doing hand-drawn um, things. We can use post-processing and we can use the kernels to detect the pixels around the one that we have um, to see whether they're whether we're looking at the edges of an object or not. So my character here, um, around a lot of the edges, um, has a black line. It's a little bit too... Um, too small to see here. Maybe I should run Genshin and show you. But anyway, it's too small to see, but there's definitely, you can see on the edge of her hair here, there's a black line that's there. That black line is not part of a texture. Uh, it's not part of um, the inherently in the character because it has to change if the character rotates. So if the character rotates, the black line stays where it is on the edge of the character. So this is something that's often done uh, as a post-processing effect to detect where a character ends and the scenery begins. And we can actually do that quite easily if we just use a depth test, right? So the difference between the Z buffer pixels where my character is and the stairway behind her, there's like meters there. So we're going to we're gonna easily detect a difference in the Z buffer. And when we detect the difference in the Z buffer, we can draw a black pixel. So there's some, some cool stuff you can do there. This is actually this lighting effect is doing the same thing where it's detecting where the sword ends and where something else appears, uh, and it's doing this glow effect here. I actually don't know if that's post-processing. I don't know if it's post-processing or that glow is um, is actually transparent geometry attached to the object. There's different ways of doing the same thing. Um, yeah, so this is not just a hand-drawn feel. There's heaps of different effects we can do. We can do like a um, neon electro future kind of thing, which is a little bit of what Cyberpunk was doing, but Cyberpunk was still kind of like pretending to be real world. If we want to be like a completely stylized thing, we can do like uh, light trails behind objects and stuff like that. And like um, give a very different feel like that kind of Tron feel, I guess. So lots of different things you can do. Um, you have to kind of, every technique that does this is individual and different. So it's very hard to kind of work with it. Huds and GUIs we didn't really talk about because A, they're very, very simple and B, your UI designer is not necessarily going to be a programmer. So this isn't something that we were, um, Simon saying most anime games may be a candidate. Yeah. yeah. And we were talking about, um, stylized things. So we've got, I actually did look up breath of the wild stuff, but I couldn't find any good screenshots where I could just go, look, here's the cell shading immediately apparent right here. Um, but 
plenty of those games work. So Hudson GUIs, um, it's very often the key elements of what makes a a user interface in a simulated real like real time three D environment. What makes a user interface good is a human design question. Um, so I would attempt, I think, to answer this question in a course like Comp 3511 rather than in 3421. So 3511 is human computer interaction. Uh, for postgrad students, 9511, I think, is the code. It's the same. So that's all about you, like design based around human use. Um, and I think that GUIs and HUDs is where it slides more into that territory for design. But if we want to do a 2D overlay, over the final frame, that's really easy. Because what we can do is we're going to take, take two dimensional objects, textures, and place them anywhere we want on the final frame buffer and just blend them. If they're transparent, if they're not transparent, you just overwrite the frame buffer wherever you want um, this HUD to appear. Um, and so heaps of games have very, very complex HUDs. Um, I should have done one that wasn't just this example, um, but um, just complex two dimensional elements that are kind of how you get enough information to, to work with a game. So I think your um your less immersive games, like your your MOBAs and your real-time strategy games where you're this magical camera in the in the sky, you're not immersed in the scene by being the character itself. You're looking down on your character. They tend to have a lot more data in the in their GUI than and their HUDs, head up displays HUDs than um than games that are designed for immersion. There are though a lot of the times where the um, the GUI elements go much closer to what we work with, which is the rendering engine, and all of the um, the user interface elements are actually fully rendered in the three D environment. One of the best examples of this is Dead Space and the Dead Space series, where they refused to have anything at screen space. Everything had to be in world space, and it's beautiful design um it's very very famous for having probably the at, especially at the time revolutionary um uh, ui design in a game so um i took this photo from uh, an interview with uh dino ignacio i i've not never i've actually like uh looked them up previously but there i, I found an interview with them i should have put a link in here anyway all the UI elements are in the scene. Your health bar is a a a like a light on your spine uh, in the game. Your energy is this other thing that's on your character. So when you're walking around, you can see how healthy you are and how much energy you have for your devices and stuff like that just by looking at your character. Any interfaces in this in the in the game are are done as overlays or projections from um, from things that happen. In the game so um what it does is it means that when you're looking at data like your inventory data or something like that when you do that in like let's say other games like the bethesda games like skyrim and fallout and stuff like that it just pops up this screen that covers up everything that you're doing and then you do all of your inventory management and stuff and so it's okay it works it's functional but every time you do it um the game is less immersive and i don't think that matters too much with numbers-based role-playing games like the Skyrim Fallout, like the Bethesda games, because you don't mind so much because you're there for the numbers. Um, but some games want to really keep you in their reality. And if you want to do a horror game, you need to hold the person in their immersion so that when the fear happens, it's real. So this is, I think, quite a brilliant design for that. Um, VR, stereoscopy, oh, I wonder how many slides I have left, I'm just looking at the time. This is something I know a lot about. I, I specifically worked in, um, uh, in this stuff for several years. So this is like, kind of like the, I mean, if you want to like, what is, what is Mark's background and why is it relevant that he's teaching graphics is like, I worked in VR before, um, before the headsets appeared. Um, so some of the tech that we would use to, to do stereoscopy. Um, and I would call it that rather than 3D. People go like, the VR goggles give you stuff in 3D. And I'm just like, yeah, we render everything in 3D. The only thing that's not 3D is the final display, right? So we're already in 3D, but how do we get to, how do we get it so we've got two eyes and giving a stereoscopic vision, which is the key. It's not, it's not 3D. Yeah. 
like anyway <laughs> just little bug bears so two eyes means two screens either that's two screens on one frame buffer or two separate frame buffers one going to each eye this really depends on the tech um when you've got multiple projectors either you split as if two they're two monitors or you've got two eyes inside a headset um i don't know the underlying tech of it um whether you render to two separate frame buffers or you render to one frame buffer that is split when it's shown either way what you're going to do is you're going to take two cameras and you're going to offset both of those cameras in your scene the wider you offset the more exaggerated the 3d effect is going to be and the bigger the headaches you're going to cause in the people <laughs> but generally you offset and then you just aim both of the cameras at some kind of focal point in the distance. The difficulty that you're going to get if you aim two cameras on an angle is their frustums are on an angle. So their frustums are not looking at the same volume. And if they're not looking at the same volume, you can get this weird clipping where you can see something in one eye and not the other. And it's awkward. If it's close to you and you can see something in one eye and not the other, that's okay because we believe in that. But if it's a case of your far planes or your near planes being on an angle to each other and there's this dead zone on either side um, where an object can appear in in like inside one's far plane but outside the other's far plane and it just literally appears in one eye and not the other then we've got problems so we tend to use asymmetric frustums for this where they may meet at the far plane or even they meet at a decided focal point in the middle uh, and then their far planes are offset and their near planes are offset. We may be able to do that as well. But the post-processing is pretty simple, right? We render two cameras to separate frame buffers um, and those separate frame buffers get put onto their, their respective eyes um, for the final view. Um, we also might do some automated warping of the final image to match up with the lens inside a headset so inside headsets we've got a specifically shaped glass lens so that we can get a wider field of view for each eye on a small on a, on a tiny tiny monitor inside the um inside the headsets so we might do some warping stuff there as another press pressing effect oh yeah and and the way how how cheng's also talking about um When we're talking about HUDs and GUIs, we could talk about the 3D rendering of, like, the gun inside the first-person shooter games where your, um, your friends and enemies around you are not going to see the same rendered gun that you are. You're going to see a very highly detailed model that's from your perspective, and everyone else is going to see your entire body holding maybe that same gun, um, but um, probably a lower-quality model that's designed to be seen from a distance. Another thing is rendering to curved monitors. I put these two in here just because this is the stuff I used to work on. Um, it's interesting that we're getting more and more curved monitors nowadays, but we're still rendering to a flat frustum. If we're rendering to a flat frustum and then taking the flat frustum's image and then tilting it around towards us, we get perspective issues. We get weird skewed perspective issues. I mean, it still makes sense to have a curved monitor because the bigger your monitor is, um, the less relevant the pixels are, the further your viewing angle is to them. And that's okay because our cameras in our scenes, if we just widen our field of view to match the size of our monitor, is going to be okay, you know, because the, the pixels are going to be in the right location. Um, but in terms of pixel density to physical pixel density to our eyes, a curved monitor makes more sense because then all the pixels are the same distance away from us. The only problem is we are not capable of rendering to a curved frustum. The maths involved in it doesn't really line up with the way that we do things um, in our current hardware with our current rendering path. So what we'll often do to deal with um, uh, a curved surface is actually use multiple cameras. So this is a really simple idea here. We've got a front camera, a left camera, and a right camera. Their frustums are, are right up against each other, so we're not going to lose any data here. And we have multiple renders that are then put into a single frame buffer so that our perspective is roughly correct for any direction we're looking at. It's never actually correct. We do have perspective shift issues across these boundaries. So you'll have this funny thing where you're looking across your curved monitor and you'll have like a, a flat line and it'll be flat in the middle and it'll be curved. It'll be on, on an angle on one side and on an angle on the other side. And when they meet, it'll be a sharp 
angle between these. So you've got to do some weird things with blending and try to actually decide whether you can correct your perspective shift issues because these multiple renders are approximations of the curve. Again, same thing we've been doing, polygons approximating curves. Um, you can, one solution to this uh, is to add more cameras. So instead of having three cameras for the curve, you can have like 10 cameras for the curve. Uh, that has the obvious issues and downsides that the more cameras you add, the more renders you're doing. Um, and even if those renders are very narrow slices of a scene, your, your, your culling is going to help you a little bit, but in terms of how much cost each of those render passes is, the less of these cameras you have, the better, but the more perspective issues you have. So it's an interesting little thing. Um, advanced transparency. So we, we looked at transparency, right? We learned that in order to render transparent objects, we need our transparent objects to be rendered after the rest of the scene and rendered in order. So the pipeline that we have is awkward for transparency because it forces us to either try to do some kind of sorting algorithm or, um, or maybe only do one transparent object. Or if we don't sort our transparent objects, understand that sometimes we're going to get artifacts where things just don't appear. Um, so things, if you have a window and another window, um, sometimes you can only see between what's between them and you can't see through them because the order wasn't correct. So there are some ways to get around this. There's, none of them are nice and none of them are easy. So one of them is like a possibility, oh, let's just render, render to a 3D frame buffer. And it's like already you just be like, like how much VRAM do you have? How much memory do you have that your frame buffer can have multiple layers? If we can multiply the size of our frame buffer, um, we're going to multiply a lot of our memory. And also um, we have to write to multiple memory locations, which is going to take us some time. But this 3D frame buffer doesn't have to be super deep. You're going to have just a few levels of it and sometimes that solves your transparency issues where you go okay this one gets rendered at this layer this one gets rendered at another layer and then we can look at those layers from the back to the front when we when we compose our final frame buffer so it's a possibility this one's a, a pretty dirty hack though it takes a lot you've, you've got to really think that that transparency is important to start doing stuff like this we can try to use hardware optimization so we can try to say okay let's get let's put actual uh, hardware optimization for sorting for depth sorting of objects onto our graphics cards. I would say that this is an approach that's sort of not really happening. I think when people are working with um, new stuff to put on graphics cards, they're putting uh, these deep learning cores on their graphics cards, or they're putting um, ray tracing cores on graphics cards nowadays. Transparency is something that's not being specifically hardware optimized at the moment. Um, there's another technique called depth peeling, which is actually a reasonably old technique. I think it's like 2008 or something like that. Um, using different Z buffers. So it's a similar thing to this 3D frame buffer, but it's only using the depth buffers um, and rendering two different depth buffers uh, and trying to kind of separate these objects so that we get an approximation of sorting in a sense. Um, of things so that we what we can do is we can render to these different buffers and say we can we can remember which objects are in front or behind each other without overriding them um, it's much more complicated than that but I have 10 minutes left so we're not going into it <laughs> advanced animation so we were pr like the only animation I told told you about in this course we didn't really even implement that much of it was pre-baked animations with keyframes linearly interpolating between them but what if um, our animations are very reliant on what is happening in the scene what if our animation needs to react to objects around us I need to pick up an object that's in the scene and I can move my body around but I still need to reach that object, right? So if they're relying on the geometry in the scene, like pressing a button or opening a door, picking up an object, or even just walking on stairs, um, we need to figure out where our contact points are and then back propagate how our joints are working. And so I said a keyword there, like back propagate, you already know that that means algorithmical complexity. Good thing for us, though, there's an entire field of research in robotics that's already working on this, and we can just copy their research into our graphics. So inverse kinematics is the, is the name of this particular 
um, technique, which is the hand goes here. So the hand goes on the handle of the door. What, what is my wrist doing? What is my elbow doing? What is my shoulder doing? Um, do these look real or not? And, and look how many different options I can have while my hand stays in the same position, right? I can do all kinds of things. I mean, my hand moved a little bit. You know what I mean? We can do, we have so many possible solutions to this problem. How do we know which one to use, right? So this is a really, really large problem space based on the number of joints you have between things. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very, very complicated. Um, involves complex numbers. I mean, a lot, a lot of people are not too scared of complex numbers, but for me, it's been so long since I've used them that it's, it's like, oh, I can't remember how to use the I. It's, I can't remember any of the algorithms that we used to use for them. But anyway, this is that. So like we take our animation from pre-baked um, and make it into real-time reactive animation using techniques like this. <laughs> Did someone say complex numbers? Are you our uh, maths? Uh, oh, wait, Dan's here. Yay, Dan can deal with it. <laughs> We're not teaching you inverse kinematics right now. Anyway, but it's it exists and it's difficult, but it's also very important um, because so much of the time, like if someone has a canned stair climbing um, algorithm, um, how is it going to match different sets of stairs? You know, are you going to to use that canned animation every time and hope it works. Like, hello, Assassin's Creed, right? <laughs> really, really obvious canned animations. Whereas nowadays we're moving towards these kinds of things instead. Uh, physics simulation. Um, now this is, this is so big. This is too big to try to include in a graphics course, but it is vitally important for how things look. So, Again, this is a similar kind of thing of like, if we pre-bake things and we have like a canned animation for, um, for human movement, we want it to be more realistic by, by matching it to the scene. We can have the same kind of thing where I could animate a ball bouncing down some stairs. Um, and that's great. It might look good for that one set of stairs, but then we change the stairs and we end the, we have a landing halfway up the stairs or something, and then suddenly my, my ball bouncing animation doesn't work anymore. The keyframes are trying to clip through that landing. It would be much better if we could just do this by saying, just drop the ball. Drop the ball anywhere and let the real-time calculation tell where it is and where it should be next. Um, so this is the idea of physics simulation. So we're animating objects just based on rules of physics rather than... Um, uh, rather than having to do all the animations in advance. Um, there's so much in this that I think that we could probably do a course on physics simulation that is as big as the course we've just done on graphics. So again, it's not something I could include. Um, liquids get a lot of benefit out of this because we have an expectancy for how they move and things, fluid movement, so fluid as opposed to liquid is things that, that move like cloth and hair, things that have um, wind affecting them or tensile force holding them together. We can use this for real-time destruction of objects. So if we have a, a building that gets hit by a rocket launcher or something, you know, like games do have that. And we were talking about Crisis the other day. It was one of the first things that did this. It was like, we can break an object at the point that you, you do damage to it. And then the loose bit of the tree at the top is now, um, uh, is now the domain of the physics simulation and the physics simulation will determine which way it falls and where it ends up and things like that. Um, so reasonably realistic simulation of collision, gravity, um, and things like that, reasonably difficult to do. I mean, it's not super difficult. It is a solved, well, solved problem. <laughs> If it was a solved problem, then we wouldn't know about physics glitches in games. So it is technically a solved problem in that if we can do this at a high enough frame rate and with enough calculation for every object in our scene, yes, it's a solved problem. If we want to do this in real time, it's a solved problem like ray tracing is. It's the same kind of thing where if you try to do this in a scene, um, you, you need the processing power to be able to do it. 
and you choose how much processing power your physics really needs. Um, often this is done on the CPU, but there are systems of GPUs to do accelerate this in hardware. Talking about PhysX, if you've heard of that, NVIDIA, NVIDIA's physics simulation system that runs on the graphics card. Um, <laughs> Babylonians were the first to sit back down. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Okay, um, oh God, I made it to the end and I got through them all. Machine learning for graphics. <laughs> So what can we do with deep learning, the new hotness that is deep learning? There is a lot we can do with this. Um, I can't remember who said it. I think it was someone from DeepMind, um, which is like Google, Google bought a company that was working on deep learning and they've become like one of the, I, know, I, guess, I guess one of the most well-funded research centers for deep, deep learning. They've done some pretty amazing stuff. Um, I can't remember who it was there, but one of them said deep learning is like electricity. Uh, when it electricity started being used in general, um, it changed a lot of different industries. And you could say that electricity could be applied to many different industries in different ways. And deep learning is that same kind of thing, where we're applying a particular form of intelligence to doing lots of different things. And it has been applied in graphics in many different ways. Um, there's some cool stuff. Um, oh, I forgot to put the video link here. There's a video link about the current series of RTX graphics cards. And we've got a section on um, on what deep learning is doing. And some of this stuff is from that, right? So if you've seen uh, art styles, um, deep learning, so with, like we trained a deep learner on stuff like Van Gogh, for example, and um, are able to take images that are just normal photographs in real time and make them look like they were painted by this particular painter and things like that. So the very cool stuff like that, we can do that in real time now as well. So um, you can do that. You can do some really cool stylistic effects, artistic effects like that. Um, the, the thing I was talking about with the inverse kinematics, we can make sure that those inverse kinematics don't like open a door with the elbow up like that, open a door with an angle that appears to be comfortable for humans um based on learning how humans do things using using something like a neural network like deep learning neural net um they're definitely already doing this for ray tracing so they don't need as many rays to calculate um the colors and illumination in a scene because they're able to predict what colors are likely to be seen in the gaps um, and that's better than just a statistical idea of just sample the colors around it and hope they're the same. This is actually like trying to predict that colors tend to be near each other like this. And if you sample other rays around it, this is what's likely to be in that ray. New keyword, new technique that's happening at the moment, DLSS. Um, you may have heard of this. You may have seen it. There's about I don't know how many games there are so far that are using this, but probably like half a dozen to 10 games, like just generally releases that have come out in the last year or so. What I was showing before, um, Cyberpunk 27.7, I had DLSS turned on. So deep learning super sampling. It's, it's, it's very good. It's got good buzzwords attached to it. But it's an interesting idea where what they can do is lower the resolution of a scene, run ray tracing on a low res version of the scene, and then super sample it, which is to bring it back up to um, a higher resolution output. And that's where the deep learning comes in. The deep learning has been able to recreate high resolution um, uh, ray tracing images from lower resolution ray traced images. So it does ray tracing in the scene and says, I can bring this back up to the actual display resolution. So you can take your 1440p monitor and do ray tracing in a much lower res and then have that illumination have an effect that still looks like it's native resolution afterwards. So it's good. <laughs> it works reasonably well. It looks like so far we're getting decent um, ray tracing effects in our scenes without actually needing to calculate the entire scene to do it. Uh, we've hit 12 and I've hit the last of those slides. So I did make it through the speed run, but I did also just want to say um, one last slide to talk about what we have learned this term in graphics. So I like this because I like the journey that we've gone on. I think we've gone on quite a significant journey of understanding from where we started off. A lot of people were interested in things. A lot of people were enthusiastic about these things but didn't really know the details behind them so we started off with the idea of tricking humans 
and that was core to what is computer graphics and i think that's important um and then we built up the technology that we're going to use to trick humans in the most efficient way possible with our system so we've gone from like primitives uh triangles textures and stuff like that through to multiple renders from different directions for different reasons of post-processing and cool effects and stuff we talked a little bit as well about how digital art and how the technology that we use to create it is driving the algorithms that we use. All of our algorithms are done like kind of an on-demand kind of thing. Like humans want to see something. Let's try to figure out what algorithm we use to make that look more realistic and stuff. And hopefully we've had a good chance to, um, to develop these things, to learn how to implement some of these algorithms and have enough of a basis so that you can do whatever you want to do with graphics from here on. So I just want to say thank you for coming along. Um, thank you for uh, taking part in this, this journey of discovery from the idea of tricking people into believing what they see into actually going behind the screen and learning how to make those tricks and make those things appear. So thank you, everyone. Um, it's been a lot of fun for me. I haven't taught this for several years um, and putting together this course again from scratch has been a lot of fun. Um, so yes, thanks for coming along. And um, I guess I don't really have anything more to say other than that. Um, I guess it's not entirely over, even though this is the last lecture, I will see some people on the discord. I will, probably be helping some people out here and there with your third assignment and stuff like that, which is your sort of third assignment take home exam thing, which is due in a couple of weeks. Um, but yeah, thanks for everything. And um, I'd say I'd see you again, but I very much doubt I will see you again because I think if anyone's taking this course from me, you're not going to take the other course that I usually teach, which is one of the prerequisites for this course. Oh, I should also say, with someone saying thank you to the tutors, thank you to the tutors as well. Um, the tutors have done some really cool work doing implementation stuff with you, uh, and you'll still be seeing them later on this week. Oh, please fill out the My Experience. It really helps us to have responses in the My Experience, especially for a new iteration of a course like this. We want to see what worked and what didn't and what your comments are, and then we'll see how we're going to change it for next time. Um, thank you all. See people saying thank you in text. Thank you for being here. Um, I really should wrap it up. I've gone over time. Um, I'm going to wrap it up and let it go here. Um, I'll see you on Discord if you want to talk any further about things, but otherwise, thank you for taking part in graphics. Goodbye, all.